So I'm here in the old Gate Crasher nightclub in Birmingham. What am I doing here? Well, I'm here to talk to Peter Marks. Peter's the CEO of one of the largest nightclub operators in the UK. And I'm here to talk to Peter about a report that they've been creating for the last three years, which is a consumer behavior report, which basically tracks what people between 20 and 30 year olds do on a weekend. And one of the things I like about the nightclub industry, apart from it's where I started my business career, is that there's so much similarities between the nightclubs and the fitness clubs in terms of the service, the experience, the energy, the atmosphere, and even how to get people into the locations and how to keep them coming back. So it's a little bit of a different episode than what we've done before, but there's some really, really interesting insights. If you listen to what Peter talks about in terms of his business and how he's reinvented himself over the years, I think you'll find some huge value in this episode. So I'd love to know what you think about. It's a bit different to what we've done before. Please leave us your comments, leave us some messages, and tell us what you think. I hope you enjoy the episode. So. I'm here with Peter Marks. I'm in the, this used to be the Gatecrasher nightclub, is that right? In Birmingham, indeed. And uh, it was one of the nightclubs I used to hear a lot about when I was growing up and when I was working in nightclubs myself. So it's a very famous venue. And uh, I guess a lot of people listening are like, well, what are you doing in a nightclub talking to a CEO of, of a nightclub, um, I guess, uh, empire? Is that in the UK. In the UK, yeah. <laughs> Um, and I'll, I'll tell a little bit about the background. There's a, a, a kind of a friend of mine and uh, it, from the fitness industry, Anthony Morrison now uh, works for you guys. That's right. Um, I was following him and I happened to, to come upon this sort of um, report that uh, his new company, which was the Deltic Group, was doing. And I was reading it and it was, and it was quite fascinating because it was, uh, there was a lot of similarities I found between what was happening just in, in the fitness industry as a whole and, and what I was reading on the report. So I, so I thought I, I contacted Anthony and sort of asked him about it and he quite kindly put me in touch with yourself. So, um, so that's why I'm sitting here in a nightclub um, talking about nightclubs. So Peter, tell us a little bit about yourself and the industry that you're in, just to, just to give everybody a little bit of context. Okay, well, first of all, I don't mind saying I'm 59 years old and I've been in this business since I was 21. <laughs> uh, so I started in 1981, uh, working in a very, very different environment to the one that we have today. Uh, I think it's fair to say that there were a lot more nightclubs and our streets were a lot fuller back then. Uh, and um, it was a different world. Uh, and I spent my entire life, that sort of 38 years of, of my working life, in the nightclub business, which is, uh, uh, shall we say, not always understood by most people, but you actually hit the nail on the head. Most of uh, the DNA of a hospitality or a leisure or an experiential business behind the scenes is very similar. And whether you're running hotels or bowling alleys or cinemas or health and fitness, you still need a lot of the disciplines that are the same. Uh, and then, of course, it's the product that's different. And it's very different today than it was back in 1981, I can tell you. Right. And, and a little bit about the Deltic Group then. So, you know, how many locations, what sort of, what is the business itself then? Well, um, we are the largest specialist operator of nightclubs in the UK. We've got 53 nightclubs. They're nearly all the largest club in their town. They're in domina dominating positions uh, in, in the center of town. And uh, uh, we bought the business out of administration, actually. Uh, uh, the company that owned it was a PLC called Luminar. Uh, and it had grown into a one billion pound business. But then through a variety of changes, uh, in habits and other boring but important stuff like having too much debt, it finally collapsed into administration in 2011. And we just came along because I knew most of the sites, I knew a lot of the management. I was not in the company then, I, I was completely separate and doing other stuff. Uh, we just came along with a group of investors and looked down the list and we said, well, look, we should bid for these clubs. And if we're to win a bid war, with administration uh, and administrators the other side, we had to take as many as we possibly could because they like to do it all in one deal. And we just uh, pulled this deal off in three weeks. It was, it was remarkable. And, and with that previous company then, what were some of the external factors that were causing it to, to happen? Was it just badly run or was there shifts in the market that caused it, you know, caused them probably not to pivot when they maybe should have done, do you think? 
Well, if you don't mind, I'm going to go back to the 80s yeah. um, uh, on that one. Because to start with, uh, in 1980s Britain, basically all the pubs shut at 11 o'clock. Uh, and the clubs had a monopoly post-11. And they all shut at 2. So 11 till 2, uh, especially Friday and Saturday, up and down the country, there would be queues outside of all the nightclubs. And a city might have 10 nightclubs and a town might have 5 nightclubs. And uh, there'd be, uh, obviously I'm generalising there, some will have a lot more and a few a lot less. But you had that absolute monopoly. So that meant that if you wanted a drink after 11 o'clock, pretty much, unless you went to a casino, that was the only place you were going to get one. So you had everyone from 18 to 50, 55 years old. And there'd be a pyramid. There'd be a lot more 18-year-olds than 55-year-olds. But generally speaking, that was how it worked. And uh, you had... Um, uh, you, you know, you had queues outside when you opened at nine o'clock. Uh, if you, you know, it, it was that popular. And of course, gradually, taste changed. More clubs opened, actually. Uh, and then the real game changer, I guess, was licensing reform in the UK. And uh, the Labour Party decided it was an absolute vote winner to allow 24-hour licensing throughout the country and let the councils then decide who shut when. And Although 24-hour licensing really doesn't exist anywhere in the world, other than when the Olympics are on in the Olympic City or such like that, uh, it did give the flexibility for councils to say, well, I'll tell you what, we want clubs to shut at five o'clock and the pubs can shut at one or two. And that was the game changer. Because what happened then, and that was back in 2003, four, although it was creeping in beforehand, is that suddenly the nightclubs no longer had a monopoly. Right. And, and um, with, with that being said then, how did companies like yourself then uh, innovate? Because I guess that was, a, that was a big change. And I suppose in all businesses, regardless of what industry that you're in, that you get this time where there's massive change and you have to respond. What was, you know, how, how did you think about responding to that? Because that must have been quite a threat to, to your business and these big venues where you're actually paying to come in and there was a lot of these pubs where you were just coming in free as long as, as, long as you could drink, I guess. Yeah. Well, the first thing is we knew it was coming, so it wasn't difficult to sort of plan for it. But the difficulty, of course, was, first of all, I think the nightclub industry didn't believe how much it would change things and would take the older people out of their clubs because basically... 18 to 25 year olds still absolutely adore clubbing. They love clubbing. But once you get a bit older, you're a little bit more sophisticated, you're, you're wanting a more premium offer, a more personal service, then it's the older people that sort of stopped coming and they stayed in the bars. Now, um, I think getting back to the question of how do we adapt as an industry, well, it all depended on your balance sheet, as boring as it sounds, because um, if you had a lot of debt, and you were used to throwing off a lot of cash to service that debt, and suddenly you lost 10% of your income on the door, which went from maybe 35% of your income down to 25 and even 20%, that's a game changer. And I think that if you go back to that time, um, and it's always complex, it's not just one thing. We had banks throwing money at every company going, debt was cheap, so companies just burden themselves with enormous amounts of debt. And the ones that survived and saw through it were those that, first of all, had the money to carry on investing in their premises up and down the country against the bars that were fabulous and now open until one o'clock in the morning. And those that didn't have so much um, in the way of debt and, of course, rent. Because what you'll find, and again, this is similar in health and fitness or cinemas, is that you have high operational gearing. It only takes 10% to come off the top line to take 50% off the bottom line uh, in, our, in our space. And, and that's what squeezed um, Luminar and lots of other companies. Right. But what then happened over the next sort of five years was that the demand supply got back into kilter. So as clubs were closing, those that were left could actually make a living. So that between 2005 and 2010, something like 50% of the nightclubs by number closed. By the way, that included a lot of pretty grotty, uh, down at heel, filthy basement type clubs that got away with it because they'd had a monopoly yeah. for all those years. Um, but uh, the, uh, 
demand supply eventually equalizes. And by around about 2011, 2012, we've got a much more level, stable playing field. Uh, and actually, uh, again, I don't know whether it's just a UK phenomenon, but we've got casual dime, dining, you know, the Frankie and Bennies and the Chiquitos and, and the Bella Pastas of this world that have actually had a lot of pain because everybody opened these uh, uh, chain restaurants and the uh, private equity money was pouring in. And, you know, I couldn't raise money to uh, buy a nightclub business. Uh, to save my life uh, six, seven, eight years ago because they just wanted stuff that was selling food. But of course, they're now dealing with this oversupply. And it's like this sort of shakeout. And a lot of them are closing. And maybe in another five years' time, they will have equilibrium. Right. Do you see, like you've been in business now for a while and seen a lot of these trends. Do you see that in terms of raising capital where you've got the, the, the sort of, I guess, um, you know, poster child of, of, of the month or the year and then everybody puts the money in and then there's oversupply and then they crash down. Is, is that something you've seen over your years in business? Only all the time. <laughs> <laughs> no, you can't believe it. But the thing is, you should be able to predict it. But if you are uh, a fund manager and you're placing money, you'll often think, well, I'll get in, make some money and get out. Um, before it bursts, um, because you can sort of see a bubble. And I, I remember uh, once going to a presentation and, and uh, uh, the speaker put a graph uh, up and he, and he said, this is casual dining. And he said, uh, this is the growth in casual dining restaurants and this is the growth in demand, still going up. And this is a bubble. <laughs> and so, yeah, you do see it. And we saw it uh, in nightclubs, we saw it in bars, uh, we saw it in casual dining, and of course we see it in other um, sort of non-leisure activities as well. But above all else, I'm a fan of the going out market. And I love to see uh, other companies invest in the high streets, because I can't ha have the only club in a town that has only poor offers. I want to see invested pubs, invested restaurants, so the people are going to not stay at home uh, with you know, three cases of beer watching Netflix, I want them to come out and enjoy the nighttime economy. And that nighttime economy can never be just one of us. So for me, it's great news that that sort of equilibrium is back there. And we're seeing more and more investment coming in to what was the traditional, what we call the wet led, i.e. drinks led venues, because food has become very hot to handle, pardon the pun, because it really, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's oversupplied costs are going through the roof. Uh, we've got the, um, obviously the, the pound to the euro and the pound to the dollar means that importing stuff is more expensive. And the labor you need for food is also, you know, a, a high percentage. You know, you can run a bar with a 25% to 30% labor charge. A lot of the restaurants, you know, their labor's pretty much fixed at 35% and it can get to 40% in no time at all if you have 10% off the top line. Yeah. So you've got to watch the model works for you. And what, what about rent? So you, do you, when you're in that bubble stage, are you seeing the landlords putting the rents up as well? So when you come back into the business like you did, was that an opportunity to renegotiate some of those costs or not really? Well, that's a tough one because right. a lot of the uh, landlords were in a financial mess as well. Uh, so they were all indebted to their eyeballs. And, uh, you, you know, if you're working with a big fund, first of all, they move at an incredibly slow pace. They might have 200 properties on there, but with one fund manager, so a pension fund. And so it really um, wasn't easy to just come along and reduce rents because a lot of our rents are owned, our, our properties are owned by uh, pension funds because they're in city centers. So they're unlikely really to be uh, sort of personal uh, high net worth families or an individual guy who's made a bit of money and put himself uh, out there as a landlord and bought two or three properties, which meant, you know, it's almost glacial place, uh, a pace rather to, to, to try and get some of these renegotiated. But of course we try uh, because, you know, you've got to have a sustainable business. And in nightclubs, we always say that 10% of our turnover can afford to be rent. Once you're going over that, you're beginning to work for the landlord. Uh, so it, it, it's a balance. You want the best site, you're probably not going to be able to smash the rent, rent to pieces. But we have these um, uh, rent review clauses called RPI clauses, Retail Price Index. And that basically means that whatever the inflation index is on a set day of the year, that's the RPI for the year. And they're linked to that. And the problem is if you've got 
you know, inflation at two or three percent, five year reviews, you're suddenly getting slapped with a 20 percent increase in your rent uh, because it's cumulative, isn't it? It's compound interest. Uh, and how many businesses have seen uh, uh, their prices go up by 20 percent compound We've got more competitive pressures, so the prices are held low. So you get that squeeze of top to bottom line margin. So that where you used to maybe, uh, you know, have a, a gross profit margin of 85% and a EBITDA margin of maybe 25, 30%, you've probably now got a GP of around about sort of 79 or 80 in our sector, and you're running a sort of 17, 18% on the bottom line. And you don't really want to be going below 15. Yeah. So, you know, although it's an exciting business, the financial model and the balance sheet is the boring stuff that means you don't go bust. <laughs> That's right, absolutely. So, so looking at the people then that come into your businesses, and I, again, I guess they're the similar people that are going to the restaurants and going to fitness clubs and coming into here. You know, going back, I guess, sort of 80s and 90s, what, what were the people and that, you know, call them the sort of tribes and the groups like then, um, and do they differ from now in any way? Like you mentioned about the fact in your world, they were a lot older because there was this monopoly and that's all people had. But were there any other sort of differences in terms of the, you know, the, the, the people that frequent these types of places? Yeah, well, a couple of things. First of all, one of the, I don't want to miss this one, but uh, when I started in 1981, men had only started dancing on the dance floor <laughs> about a few years before properly. <laughs> they used to stand around the edges uh, and then wait until 11, uh, sorry, yeah, maybe 1.30, and then they'd had enough to drink to feel they pluck up the courage. But John Travolta changed the world from the point of view of nightclubs and men would happily go on the dance floor early on in the evening, even on their own without a girl there. So that, so that was, that was a bit of lucky timing. But what changed after that? By the way, that was even before my time. Before, uh, 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 so, so what changed after that really has been that, um, people's tastes have got a lot more sophisticated. They want more. They want good value. And of course, the other thing that's underlying, when I was a student, when I went to university, I was in the 5% of the population that were lucky enough to go to university. Now, um, we have 50% of the population going to university. And uh, whilst that's a good thing for society, that we've got better trained uh, people, uh, and the economy is enormously different, there's not much manufacturing these days, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But what it's done is that it's made half of the 18 to 21 year olds extremely price sensitive. Right. So we have two markets, and, and that's what's changed from the 80s and 90s when you pretty much have one market. And do you know what? I remember we didn't even allow students in, uh, in, in when I started. <laughs> if you look like you're a student, sorry, not tonight. And they'd all be dressed in black uh, and, uh, you know, sort of T-shirts and going to the indie and rock clubs. So they wouldn't want to come into the mainstream clubs. You know. And they didn't want to come in, by the way. Uh, but, of course, it became an enormous part of our business uh, back in the 90s and, and, and the early noughties. And where uh, just about any midweek night uh, in a city now will have a student night, may have two but, you know, it's funny how these things stick. Bristol, it's going to be Monday and Wednesday. And Leeds, it's Monday and Tuesday. And, uh, and every city has these sort of historic student nights that have been going forever and re remain the case. And then on a Friday and a Saturday, you're into your weekend crowd. And, and, uh, and Saturday's your premium night when you get uh, uh, your, uh, uh, I guess, the most sophisticated customer who's not so price conscious. Uh, uh, Friday's sort of the same sort of crowd, but a little bit more price conscious. So you've got these two markets, right. and you've got to treat them differently. You market to them differently. You offer uh, students uh, good deals, um, whereas these you offer them great service and, and great product. They want the best brands. They want them served at their table. Uh, they want to, uh, you can see around here, they want sophisticated surroundings. You know, gone are the days when you could just paint a basement black and stick some light and sound in there. You know, they want a lot more. And, and we often talk about sort of social media and how that's changed. People these days, whether they're students or not, they want to share their night out. Uh, they want Instagrammable moments. So we factor in designs and stuff and service and bottle to table and sparklers and all the other paraphernalia so that people will take photographs and say, hey, look at me, I'm having a great time. They want to share their experience on social media. 
So is, that, is, is some of that driven by age? Like you mentioned in that you've got the students on the Mondays and Wednesdays that come in. Is that generally a younger crowd to what you're getting on a Friday and a Saturday? Right? Yeah, typically Monday to Wednesday, we're almost exclusively 18 to 21. Right. Uh, whereas on a uh, weekend, we probably go 18 to 30. Right. And there'll be a lot more o- over 25s in. Um, but when it comes to Instagram and Snapchat and Facebook, they're all on it. Really? They're all on it. By the way, I'll let you into a secret. I'm not on Facebook, never have been. <laughs> but I fumble my way through Instagram and a few other things. I so, don't, it's not me personally, but of course I'm running a business where it's enormously important. Yeah. And, and I, I want to come back to that last point for a second. But as you mentioned, sort of social media then. So how do you, as a, a, you know, as, as a business leader, where most of the people are probably half your age and you're trying to think about the experience and what, you know, what triggers people? How do you stay in touch with the fact that they want to have the bottle and put it on Instagram? How do you get that, that sort of research and knowledge? The number one thing, employ people the right age. <laughs> because I recognize that I'm not, uh, uh, you know, some sort of guru who understands what an 18 year old is thinking now. The generation Z or Z uh, is a different sort of animal to the one that I grew up. But I recognize as a management style that I allow and empower people to do a good job and do what they think is best. Uh, I couldn't possibly know. What I, what I do know is that I go around a lot of businesses around Europe, around the world, and I'll have ideas on design and on social media, and I'll pass them on. But then, you know, other people who are far more in touch with our market will actually sort of translate my, should we say, clumsy old guy ideas yeah. into something that's really going to work. But, but you know, social media has changed the world. And, um, and it can be your great friend, and it can also be your enemy sometimes, as we know, because people can turn against you, can have a campaign against you out of something of nothing. So you've got to be cognizant. You know, we, we now have social media, not in, only in every one of our clubs, but we have a group of six people at the central office in Milton Keynes putting out campaigns and also responding to um, sort of requests or, or criticisms and trying to turn them into positives. Yeah. We, we, we talked about social media off camera um, and an interview with Mark Mastroff and, and yeah. traditional marketing. Yeah. <laughs> so what, how do you deal with that then? Because I guess you are of a different age. I put my father in that who's a different age. But, and, but, but you know, you're obviously being led by young people in terms of what they want. But is there, you know, how do you get that balance? Because you obviously identified something that Mark said. Yeah. about you know, traditional marketing, digital. What, what, what is your role as a leader to ensure that you don't go too far one way and you're well, balancing you know, things? As ever, uh, I look at numbers. And uh, what I found over the last uh, three, four months is that we are spending more and more and more on social media. And we're spending more on entertainment. And yet my admissions are flat. So I then start asking myself how... Uh, beneficial it is and do I get good value out of it there's no question that you know Facebook have got fantastic algorithms that are really targeting uh, the right market uh, the right person the right time and giving them you know an idea of what's going on that evening or showing them maybe some uh, fantastic scene of an exciting club atmosphere. I mean, our clubs have got two, 3,000 people in them. They make fantastic short Instagram and Snapchat and Facebook videos. I mean, they're, they're, they're fabulous. But I'm thinking, they don't really seem to be going anywhere. Uh, you know, and you sit there on the train and you see people flipping up through their phone. You know, you know they're probably scrolling the height of the Empire State Building every single week. And I'm thinking, how much does that really sink in? But you know, what do I know? I, you know, but Peter, remember, these guys are young and they know what they're doing. Then I saw you interview Mark. And he said something that literally has changed my mind and almost my thinking on our business. And that is... There is a place for that, and it is important. But you can become over-reliant on it, and that you can just stri- strip back all the other traditional methods of marketing and just do this. But it's such a crowded space, and it's expensive these days. It used to be free. It isn't. We're spending a million pounds. Our turnover is 106 million pounds. That's, so I've gone from nothing to a million pounds. That's 1% of my margin. And I can't pass it on in 30 pence on the drinks because we're now doing a social media department because that's not how it works. So um, when uh, he said there's room for a traditional, 
the penny dropped with me. I'm absolutely convinced about it. And alongside that, we got a cup. We always have, if we've got 53 clubs, they don't all work to the maximum capacity. And we got two or three turnaround sites that, are being, that were struggling. And the regional directors and the local management were turning those businesses around. And one of the methodologies was old school. Flyers, ticketing teams out on the street. Uh, people don't really read these flyers, but it gives them the opportunity to engage with them and to say to come down the club. And, and, and yeah, it's as old school as you can get. And 10 years ago, I pretty much said, why are we printing anything? And now I'm saying, why aren't we doing a bit more print and getting some people out on the streets? Because it matters. Because in, in the latest generation, they're so used to a virtual world. Uh, and that whole IRL in real life world is slightly sort of needs to be rem reminded. Mm. Uh, you know, it's up, up to us to remind them of a real world. And actually, our research in the Delta Night Index showed that whilst people really value their online life, they actually value their IRL life, in real life life, more when asked, when surveyed. And going out's important. And, you know, socializing face to face is important. So I was delighted to see that. And that's a big part of it, is it? Yeah. So people still, because I, I see I've got nieces and nephews who, you know, they spend a lot, even at weekend, like you said, they're on the Instagram and they're with their friends on, a, on these group chats and they don't go out. Are you saying that people still want to go out and socialize? That's an important thing to people nowadays. Right? Yes, it is. Right. Uh, they go out less often. Right. But they go out for occasions more than they do. When I was a lad, I'd go out every Friday night with my guys and Saturday with my girlfriend. And that's sort of the stereotype that you had to live by. Actually, I didn't really go out. I was working in clubs, but we're on the few weekends of the year uh, because I was. When at the age of 22 or something, I was, I was working uh, at weekends. But um, uh, it's, um, it's really important uh, for people to go out and celebrate their birthday still. Or go and celebrate stags and hens and all of those big occasions. And of course, if we put acts on, you know, big name DJs, they'll want to come and see them. Right. So people go out very much for occasions more than regular. 50% of our uh, admissions are on a Saturday. The rest are spread throughout the week. But we have seven and a half million customers. Uh, and that's pretty stable. Uh, for our business. So that tells me they want to come out. And, uh, uh, but as I said, with the supply demand more in kilter, we can make a, a decent living out of what's there. And people, we don't see any diminishment in that. And maybe, and maybe I'm being wildly optimistic, but maybe we will see a little bit of a backlash against um, social media socializing as people will think, hey, you know what? We've been doing this for years. We had great fun last night when we went to a gig or to the cinema. We need to do a little bit more of it. Mm. Yeah, make it more sort of personal, I suppose. Yeah. In terms of the experience, you know, going back again, 80s, 90s to where we are today, um, and obviously have, being in the position where you had this monopoly, you know, back in the 80s and 90s, has the experience the customer experience in terms of your team had to change i know when i used to work in nightclubs you know you always the, the manager was at the front he would come around and shake your hands and the clubs i worked in they were always quite prominent and there was there was still that element of service and you know the girls parties the manager would come over and try and make them special and that kind of stuff is that is that still the same and those are fundamentals of this business or do you, has, it, has it improved? What, what are the changes you, you think? Well, I'll tell you, uh, that's a really interesting point you just reminded me. Uh, when I was a club manager, uh, I used to know loads of my customers uh, and you'd go and shake them by the hand or give them a kiss on the cheek and they knew you and they were going there as much. We know Peter. Uh, yeah. you know, I think we've sort of slightly lost that. Uh, as an industry, and not just um, nightclubs, but I think a lot of bars uh, and restaurants. We've got professional managers that maybe have become a little bit too figures-oriented and maybe um, not enough on making it personal. And that's something I like to see. And certainly, I wouldn't want to say all my um, uh, club managers are uh, not hospitable, but it's something that we always look for. I like to walk around the town with one of my managers and have a load of people as we walk along the street say, hi Chris, hi Neil, because it means that they're part of the social fabric. Mm. But it's, I think it's an important part of, uh, uh, of running a successful nightclub. Uh, you're talking about other things and what else you, you do. Well, people want service. People want to be served quickly. When we started out, 
um, back in the 80s. How many times have you been to a club where you couldn't get served for 15 minutes? <laughs> We're now looking at service times. That we, we target two or three minutes because we want to keep, uh, we, we want to make it, uh, that's what people are expecting. We want to make it a good, good thing. We don't want people leaving and thinking, well, you know what, it's a good night, but do you see how long it took us to get served? So it's all about those expectations. And uh, people are going out more, and they're going out to restaurants and clubs and bars, and the whole service level is way over what it used to. Yeah. We've got training, we've got um, obviously a lot more uh, going on when it comes to uh, uh, sort of how to entertain and how to be hospitable with, um, uh, with a customer than ever before, and I don't see that changing. No. I, I know... I, certainly when I come back, I, I'm in, living in the US and I come back to England and I also see a lot of the, the, the sort of chains popping up. So you've, you, you know, you've got what, what I don't think you, you, I noticed years ago, even though a lot of the nightclubs are all loaned by chains, I guess. But it, it seems as though you kind of had this person and this face that, like you said, you, you almost went there because that the manager, just by coming and tapping you on the shoulder, in front of your friends, it's like, oh, he's made me feel special, you know, and, and, and it's, oh, come, you know, so-and-so knows me, you know, he'll get me a table or whatever. And there used to be so much of that. And even in restaurants, my friend's in that business now, and he's very good at that. You know, he'll kind of sit you down and, and just spend a few minutes chatting with you. And, it, and like the old Italian restaurants, you kind yeah, of get yeah, the guy. Yeah. And, uh, do, do, do you think just general business or like leisure and entertainment, we've lost that because you, you have got these big chains and they have to train lots of people to do stuff and that personal touch is difficult to train do you think or i get that well we always say you know hire the personality train the skill okay uh and i think it's up to us as senior management to make sure that we don't lose that uh if i've got a guy who's um or, or girl that's you know sort of like every audit is 100 percent, and every single hr form is filled out on time and so i've probably got someone who loves being in the office and doesn't particularly like doing uh, the, you know, the the, uh, the front of house stuff. So I, if I get someone saying, "Oh, they failed their audit," uh, uh, you know, two or three times, uh, I'll, I'll then look at the sales graph. And if, if the sales are going very nicely, thank you. I'm a little bit more forgiving than maybe I should be because you're right. You know, we're very good at sort of imposing structure to the to the you know almost to the cost of are we getting the right people in to do the job and uh, uh, and face the business mm. but likewise whilst we are a chain in effect we have a number of brands uh and concepts actually we're really happy if and here we are in birmingham so i'm going to use chris uh, if most people think chris owns the business mm. we don't mind because actually that means that chris is doing a good job and it's often the case that people will know um, the manager and assume that he's the guy who, you know, runs the business and owns the business. And certainly when it comes to younger people, it's lost on them that it might be part of a, a larger PLC and that there's, uh, you know, a chief executive and below him an ops director and below him a regional director. And, and there's this huge structure. As far as they're concerned, Chris is the man. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. What about the experience? Has, has that in terms of, you know, I know, I know like nightclubs, you've got nice lighting and nice sound, and that always seems to be a cons constant. But how have you seen things in terms of your experiences changed? And what are some of the trends that have come in that probably, I guess, people who don't go to nightclubs anymore wouldn't have noticed? Well, uh, light and sound's enormously important. It really differentiates us from a lot of the pubs and the bars. Um, and um, some, something as simple as LED lighting and... Uh, and uh, fantastic uh, video walls have transformed a lot of our venues as well because, uh, you know, a few years ago, you couldn't afford this sort of kit. It was only, you know, if you were going around with the Eagles and turning up at Wembley, you can spend that sort of money. Now, uh, even simple clubs have got fantastic light, sound and video, uh, which creates that sort of fantastic environment, that uh, effect, because they can afford it. Because this stuff has come down to, uh, you know, I don't know, a quarter of the price that it used to be a few years ago. So, so that sort of that's important. Is that some of these things that we're seeing going yeah. on now? Is that all LED? Is yeah, absolutely. Right. And um, that set there will probably be about ten thousand right. pounds. Now, ten years ago, it would have had nothing like the quality of output, and it would have been fifty thousand pounds. 
and we wouldn't put it there. So, <laughs> but, um, so uh, yeah, so the feel is important. And of course, the other things are, I mean, I'm going back a few years again, but all our clubs have got heating and air conditioning. Now, again, going back to the early days, the heating was when everyone was in. <laughs> and uh, the, and but the air conditioning didn't exist. So if you're old enough, you might actually remember the time when the, you'd, you know, there'd be streams of sweat g- dripping off mirrors and down walls in some of the old uh, old clubs. We don't get any of that now. So so the whole environment is, is a lot more professional. So it's not just service, but it's the environment. And then people want table service. So they are willing to pay to sit at a table and have drinks brought to them all night. Now that did not happen 15 years ago in the UK. It came from the States. Uh, uh, and then you know, it went to other holiday places that people saw like Ibiza and, and maybe Dubai. And, uh, and then of course people expect it uh, in London. And then from London, it went around the rest of the uh, rest of our state. And uh, reality is that uh, I would say six, seven years ago, we sold no booths. And now, if you want to sit down in one of our clubs, you're going to have to pay for it if it's the weekend. Right, right, okay. And, and in, in terms of doing things like that, and I guess I'm, a, I'm talking to business at general then, by, I, I guess what, it, what you've got is you've got your standard offering and then you've introduced some sort of premium offering yeah. with a higher level of service. Do, are you finding then people are very happy to pay for a, for a premium service and and an experience. Yeah, enormously. Right. Um, and it's sort of, it's a way of almost selling a first class ticket right. when you've got a room of a thousand people and maybe only 50 people want first class. Right. So yeah, I mean, we say premiumization in drink and in service has been one of the biggest drivers for us over the last uh, five years. Uh, when I took over, we sold a lot of discount brands and that was right for the student market, but it was not what the weekend crowd wanted. And they want more and they want good value. And uh, the whole drinks industry is an interesting one uh, because every week there's another product out. Really? What, like a, a, some sort of liquor or something? You know? Yeah, I mean, five years ago, you, gin was just there. You might have two flavors. Uh, you know, you'd have literally two. Now, the gin boom has just gone bananas in this country. And, um, There is a reason for that. It's a subtle reason, but basically you can uh, make gin and sell it within a matter of days or weeks. Whiskey takes years. So you put the money, you put your white spirit into a barrel and then you might get some of it out in three, but it might be 15 years before you get your money back. So this gin thing sort of works for a lot of the whiskey distillers. Uh, And so they started doing all of these sort of gins. And then after that, a lot of people started their own gin uh, manufacturing. And so, I mean, just in, up the road in Northampton, there's a fantastic uh, a local gin producer. Uh, and that guy was a farmer and he started doing gin and he's got four flavors and he's, and he's enormous and probably hoping that Diageo will come along yeah. and buy him one day. But so the drinks industry uh, uh, is incredible. And one of the th- research uh, pieces that we've had is that people used to stick to one or two or three drinks. I'll have a beer. Then I'll have a, maybe a red wine, and then maybe I'm going to have finish my night off with a brandy or rum. And you know that was rum what you, uh, yeah, and that's what, that, obviously <laughs> rum and coke for you. But um, but that uh, that that is so different now. People call it drinks uh, promiscuity. People will have a choice of 12, 13, 14 drinks that they will dip in and out of wow. regularly. So you've got to find the space for those drinks because we want people to come in and get the drink they want. So the whole way that you build your bars, your back bars, your fridges is entirely different from you know, going back all those years. Yeah. So how did, what, what do you think's driven that? Because I, I guess it makes sense, I'm the same. I'll go, because you hear of all these different cocktails and you say, well, I'll try that one. And they do a good sort of so-and-so here and I have the espresso martini here or whatever. How, what, what, what drives that in your business? Is it the drinks manufacturers marketing to the people who are coming in your clubs, or do you work with the drinks manufacturers to kind of create these trends? How, what, what's the dynamic? Well, uh, that? that's, a, that's, a, that's a great question. Uh, first of all, we're big clubs, so we don't try and uh, be um, first through the door on these things. Right. We uh, see our friends that are in uh, sort of the smaller bars uh, and maybe the smaller clubs, 
uh, will try different cocktails, different spirits, different whatever, beers. Beers is another one. The craft beer movement has been incredible. Um, and so we, we will normally see them sort of uh, create the demand that will then uh, lead us to think, right, we need to now be stocking uh, a, a, an IPA or we need to be stocking more gin. So we see it like that. But we also work with the biggest drink suppliers to try and create uh, an experience that works um, for both us and the customer. And so you'll end up with someone like Diageo, you know, one of the biggest companies in the world in our sector who sell and, and own a myriad of top brands who will create, uh, maybe with you know, uh, some celebrity endorsement, say Ciroc, uh, and then they will put millions into promoting that brand. And they'll often promote say Ciroc or maybe others, I'm just choosing Ciroc, um, to be able to sort of then create the right environment, the imagery and the, and the brand uh, uh, experience so that people want to sort of drink Ciroc when they go home and drink Ciroc if they go to another bar. So to a certain extent, the big guys like Diageo can do that sort of thing and, and Bacardi, but a lot of the smaller guys, they, they can't. Right. Okay, and do you, do you, is that very much a partnership then between you and the and the sort of drinks? Yeah, manufacturers? yeah, yeah. And, and we we have this thing called Big Night Out, and once a month, uh, the clubs, the biggest clubs, will have a, a, a package, an entertainment and a, uh, a sort of a floor show package, and, and, and big screens behind the DJs, uh, and it will be sponsored by, say, Sir Rock or Smirnoff, uh, and it will be the Smirnoff Big Night Out, and. Uh, uh, and that way you get great collaboration. It's fantastic exposure. And for those guys, they'd rather work with um, big clubs because they get more bang for their bucks than they will do a small uh, pub, for example. Yeah. So that's pretty obvious. But So the whole thing is an enormous part of what we do. And we probably get about a million pounds a year in, in various sponsorship and marketing relationships that we then reinvest that will help drive our sales and help expose their brands. Do you think it's it's important for for you guys? So you are the bigger clubs. You know, you got a lot yeah. more people in there, thousands of people coming in. Do you think it's you, it's important to sort of stay um, true to what you're about? Because I guess if you're a smaller, like I call it a boutique nightclub, where you've got you know just one type of music and you can kind of get really creative on the bar, do, do you do you have to? separate yourselves from them because you are offering things on a bigger scale and you have got more people and you, you probably can't be as as risky to, to implement some of these sort of niche strategies. Yeah, well, first of all, wherever we can, we have three room venues. Right. We mix the music up. We sort of go mainstream house and chart music in the main room. We have a retro room uh, uh, with the uh, lit dance floor, the, uh, you know, the... Saturday Night Fever dance floor. By the way, they didn't exist anywhere I knew in the 80s, but everybody thinks they did, and, and they're fabulous rooms. And then we have an R&B room. So wherever possible, we split that, and that allows us to be niche with our music taste. But we are not um, offering cool underground uh, um, offerings to customers because those sort of customers wouldn't want to come to a big club. They want to go to the small independent clubs um, uh, and there aren't enough of them to make uh, you know make a good crowd for us and we always say we we sell atmosphere you yeah. can't go into a club you can go to a gym and if there's 15 of you in the gym you'd probably think fantastic I can get on all this equipment and get round in an hour and I don't have to wait for anything mm -hmm. if you've got 15 people in a one and a half thousand capacity club you you're out the door yeah. <laughs> so so we need to fill it and that means that we need the widest um, spectrum of of customer going, which means that we can't be uh, be cool and niche, etc. Try and do some stuff, but most of the time, you know, we're we're broad church. Yeah, and that's an interesting um, observation, and it relates a lot, I guess, to, to to the fitness market. You know, in terms of you having these three different rooms, nightclubs years ago, you'd have the big dance floor, maybe you'd have like a VIP room, yep. and that was about it. What what do you think? What, so what happened? What caused that change for? The traditional big club to then say now we need to kind of almost like have three concepts within the four walls i guess music tastes really um you don't have just chart music these days people stream uh and people can get any music they want at any time 
And so there is, I guess, a greater polarization of music tastes. Right. And whereas you'd have, uh, going back to the big room, one big room, they'd be waiting for the R&B set. Yeah, and true. then they might be waiting for the, the you know, set. the dance set. <laughs> and they'd all, you could see the dance floor slowly change over one record. Oh, no, this is rubbish. I'm yeah. out of here. Let's go and get a drink. And by the way, that was part of the job of the DJ. He needed to sort of move people off the dance floor to go and get a drink and get a new set on. Right. But people, uh, uh, they just want, back to that point, you know, we're, we're consumer driven. We're always looking for what consumers want and we think well what can we do that's different from uh, a small club owned by an independent or a bar and the answer is if we can have three or four offerings under one roof then that stands us out from the crowd and that gives us uh, uh, an edge and likewise people will often they like the fact that they, we've got three rooms but they only ever go to one really <laughs> that's do you find that do they do they yeah. mingle or do you find they just no. They don't. They, they ever really. wander around and mingle. Yeah. And um, dare I say, if some of the girls are getting unwanted <laughs> attention from a, a young Matthew uh, uh, back in the past, then they'll sort of go for a wander to lose him. Yeah, <laughs> but they right. usually end up in the, you know, if you like R&B, you're not going to want to go into the cheesy disco room uh, uh, with a whole load of people dancing to ABBA music. Right. That's interesting. Yeah. And, and in terms of what people are investing then I, I i chatted to anthony and i'm not sure whether you got the numbers but he w he was telling me you know in in your index report that there's a there's an amount that people typically spend yeah. per week going out there could, could you just oh yes i can tell that? you all about that first right. of all it's nothing like as much as most people think it is right. so the average night out and lots of research done on this people are spending around about 65 pounds on a night out and that's a lot of money I'm thinking, you know, do I spend that when I go out? But that includes maybe um, a drink at home, because that's part of the going out night. Uh, and then a taxi, maybe grabbing something to eat, um, bars, clubs, taxi home. So it's across the whole piece. Now, we as a company get an average spend of around about £14.50 plus VAT at 20%. And that's all we get of that. So uh, the, whilst it's obviously eight to 10 pounds on a student night, it, it's probably 20 pounds on a weekend. And in the south of England, where there's more money, more prosperity, you might get up to 30 pounds. And in some of the less prosperous towns, you might be on you know, 12 pounds on a Saturday night. But you just have to learn what works in every location with price. And if it's a price sensitive town, then you have to sort of pull back on some of the other elements of the night out because you, you, know, you can't invest in uh, service and entertainment and surroundings and price because if you did all of those things, you'd make no money. Right. So you've got to work out where you want each of those sliders on the sliding scale. You might want to dial them all back or you might want to pull one down and have the other three up on full. I guess that's the same in any uh, uh, leisure business and, uh, and, and in, in the gym business, you know, you, you've got a completely different offer if you've got uh, a budget gym mm. than you have if you've got one of these uh, gyms where you can literally have massages and you've got wet rooms and saunas and all of those things, but you're going to have to charge for it. Yeah. So you're saying that, that on average, the sort of, is that within an age group, you know, like... To, no, so we, we, I mean, no surprise that the younger have less money right. uh, and the older... Are, are you know spend quite a lot more and they're less bothered about what they spend, but they go out less. Right. Uh, you know we've got stats that pretty much say it's a straight line. You know when, when you're 18 you're spending that much, and when, and you go up to you know when you're 50 you'll be spending that much, but you're probably going out less. Okay. And so it's a case of targeting, uh, you know, different uh, uh, people on that on that slope. And of course there's less of these going out less. Yeah. So really you know you've got to focus on this middle bit. And not too much down here either, because if you're completely driven by the student market uh, and price and price sensitivity, then actually, you, you know, you, you, you've got to make the right amount of money to be able to reinvest in your business. Yeah. So you've got that. So what's that age group then for you guys? What's that sweet spot? Is it what sort of 18? Right. To no, well, as I said, students 18 to 21. Right. Uh, on a weekend, we're probably 20 to 30. That, that's, the sort, that's the sort of sweet spot age. Right. Sure, we'll get people in older and obviously the weekend 18 year olds will come in but if we're going to be sort of 10 pounds in whereas they can come on a Tuesday and it's two pounds in and the drinks are half the price on a Tuesday uh, you know as long as all your mates are going there you're probably going to go on the Tuesday. Right 
And then you're finding then on a night out, people are around about that 65 pounds that they're spending yep. for the whole night. For the whole night. And we've been doing this Deltic Night Index now for about three years. And it's amazing what, uh, you know, what it tells you that you yeah. didn't think was the case. And I was uh, on uh, TV uh, a few months ago now. Uh, and um, I was sat here just like I am with you in a, in a BBC studio up in Manchester. And they said, right, uh, Peter's here to talk about the Deltic Night Index. But before we go, we're going to, uh, uh, we, we went out in Manchester last night and we shot a whole load of people saying how much they spent on a night out. <laughs> and you know, you're sat there thinking, I hope it's something similar to what we have. And you know what? They were bob on. They're all pretty much saying the same thing. We spent 60 pounds, 70 pounds. Can't believe how much we spend, but that's what it is. Yeah. And how often then would they go out in a month then? If, they, if they're spending that per night, are they tending to do like they used to, where they go out Friday, Saturday, or is it just once a week? What does that look like? It depends on your age. Right. Uh, depends on whether you're a student or not. Students typically go out every single week. Um, the others go out twice a month. Um, twice a month. That's sort of it, yeah. Right. Whereas it used to be probably once a week. So we've seen that right. uh, we, that's all part of changing the dynamics. That's what we've adapted to. It's not really changed over the last seven years. So you're looking at someone that's around about 130-ish per month is what your tap between that 20 to 30 roughly. Yeah, yeah. Right. But of course, don't forget, we're not getting all that money. Right. So they might be spending that on going out, yeah. but we'll probably get about 40 pounds of it. Right. And in, in terms of reinvestment then, when you're looking at your numbers, what, like these, these, this place must cost a fortune to kit out with lights and sound and everything. How, yeah. how do you more or less think about when is it time to change? Because I guess when you're younger, it's like, well, I'm going to go to that latest and greatest new place and everybody moves. I, I used to see that myself years ago. And I think you see that in the fitness world. What, what's your views on that reinvestment and to keep people coming back? Well, again, it's boring, but numbers are going to tell you where, what you can afford. And right. if you end up reinvesting too much too often, you'll never make your money back. Uh, and I think it's fair to say that uh, a few years ago, a lot of the club companies got into trouble because they were investing too much in a few sites and not enough in the majority because they were deciding to spend you know, five million on one location. Uh, it's a different world. Uh, we, uh, if we're fitting a, a club out from a shell, we'd look for a three-year payback. Uh, if we are fitting one out from an existing club uh, and it's time for us to uh, fit out you know, maybe Prism in Birmingham where we're sat today, uh, then you probably look for a two-year payback. Uh, and so it's a, a lot dependent on um, you know, what's the trading level and what do you think you can take it to. You also have to maintain your club all the time. But you're right, there will be a time that you think, no, it's time now to actually sort of give a new brand and a new energy and a new dynamism. That said, if you go back maybe 10 years, you probably had to do a refurb every five or six years. Now we've got half the clubs. As long as you're keeping them invested uh, and that you're using hard surfaces and not carpets everywhere, but you know, sort of wood floors and tiles and all of the other uh, um, materials available now, then you can probably get away with eight to 10 years because there aren't the competitive pressures to have to change. And that's a good thing because, and it doesn't matter whether you're running a restaurant or a pub or a club, you've got to have a sustainable business model for people to want to invest in it. Mm. Uh, and uh, there's been, the consumer's not been in a great place right now. Um, in the UK and probably the world. Uh, and so the fact that we are investing on a longer cycle and getting our money back in two years means that we've got something that is a very sustainable model. Yeah. And I guess, I guess with, I've been in a lot of nightclubs and coming in here, like there's no smell, everything looks clean. I, I guess it's, it, it, um, I question to you though, but is it, is it just a case of, you know, really, as well as having that big, experience well factor the basics such as cleanliness and service and that is that still a key part of yeah. keeping people to come back yeah yeah absolutely i mean i could never understand people who who didn't actually clean and maintain their clubs uh but there were a few of them let me tell you more than a few uh but it's absolutely the right thing to do if you want to get a broad church of people coming in because I'll tell you now, it doesn't matter what your social background is, you could have gone to Eton. At 18 years old, you'll put up with anything. And when well, the time you get to 25, 26, it also doesn't matter if you're from a rough council estate 
uh, um, in the north of England. And I'm happy to say that because I was born on a council <laughs> estate myself, so no one can accuse me of, uh, uh, of being aloof. Uh, um, the reality, actually, uh, is that they will expect good service, good premises, good standards of cleanliness and maintenance, and they will not put up with anything else, and rightly so. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about the Deltic report. How long has it been going? What's in it? And who's it for? Well, the Deltic Night Index. Yeah, please. So we started this about three years ago. Uh, we were speaking to our PR company, Hudson Sandler. And uh, uh, every time you Google nightclubs, you sort of basically only got g bad news because no one was out there waving a flag. Um, and, uh, you know, the first thing it would say is half the nightclubs in the UK have shut. Well, actually, that all was ancient news. You know, that's pretty much stopped being the case since 2011. Uh, and then it would say, well, there was an incident in such and such a nightclub. Uh, and uh, so-and-so was taken to court and charged and, uh, you know, and, and sentenced. And, uh, uh, and that was it. So I think, why is no one ever talking about what a great investable business the nightclub industry is? And um, we think there's probably two things. One is that people, as they grow up, stop using nightclubs and think that they're a thing of the past just because they, they do. It's a little bit like saying schools have gone out of fashion because you no longer go to school. So that was crazy. But likewise, we knew that we got a great business and a great story. And we were building up that story. And we thought we need, we need to take the lead. We're the largest um, late night operator of pure nightclubs. We've got other many good pub companies and bar companies out there as well. And we, they're, fr they're friends of ours. Uh, and um, we felt it was important to get the message across to customers, to uh, investors, and to um, maybe uh, the media as well, that there's a lot more good stuff going on. So, uh, Apart from that, it wasn't just a PR exercise. We wanted to learn about what our customers were thinking, how often they went out, who was going out, why they were going out, what drinks they drank. So we ended up coming up with a set of standard questions along the lines of how often do you go out, how much do you pay, what are you drinking, where else have you been on a night out, and those sort of things, standard. And then uh, we used to, uh, or we still do, um, uh, this is a quarterly survey, have four or five bespoke questions of something that suddenly has grabbed our interest. Um, and uh, we want to know a bit more about it. And that could be anything from how important is it for the town centre to be healthy and be invested in, uh, and how far would you travel if your own town wasn't up to much, which was some really interesting stats yeah. there. And we can see that certainly throughout the UK, the cities are getting more and more powerful and more magnetic, and they're drawing from the towns around. And so you've got Uber, and you've got all-night uh, trams and buses and trains, and the cities are prospering, but they're killing the towns around them. Right. So yeah, that's, that's one of the sort of things that we need to understand. And another one brought about by my dear friend Mark Maslov was actually, well, just how important is uh, social media and how does that compare with your in real life experience? And we got some fantastic uh, feedback on the IRL uh, that was almost a fantastic relief to any of us that are operating because a lot of people are saying, yeah, people just socialize online. They date online. Well, yeah, they do all of that, but they've been doing that for 10 years. You know, how old is Tinder and all of the other things now? They're in the numbers, so they're not changing. Uh, but we do know that um, Generation Z or Generation Z are spending so much more time on social media. And you try taking a phone off a 15-year-old girl and see how long you last. You know, it's, it's hard. Uh, not that I have to worry about these sort of things these days, but I know I've got uh, friends... Uh, uh, work alongside that, you know, will test, you know, absolutely testify that's really hard work. So getting back to it, we need to understand these sort of things mm. to be able to say, you know, we've got an investable business and there's a lot more good news out there. And so for the whole of every stakeholder guy, whether it be customer or, or bank or financial institution, you can actually sort of see that forget the headlines that belong to the past, that dare I say it belong to the era of lazy journalists yeah. where, you know, and listen, these newspapers, they're struggling. So most of, their, most of their research is just online with a guy who's covering leisure 
and petrochemicals and I don't know and uh, uh, something completely unrelated and he's grasping around and he'll just google stuff and suddenly come up with uh, stuff that just belongs to so long ago uh, I love it when people tell me, oh, well, every Friday and Saturday on the streets of Britain, it's full of people reveling. And I'm thinking, Fridays? Have you been out on a Friday lately? <laughs> They're half as busy as a Saturday. They're stable. But as soon as a journalist or presenter on TV says every Friday, Saturday, that, right, you've not been out for 15 years. And is, is that something you've just taken on yourselves then? Or do you share that with you know, like competitors, is it something for the, for the whole of your industry? Do you know, uh, we talk about competitors, th th they genuinely are nearly all good friends really? because we have this sort of, uh, uh, as I said earlier, this relationship of wanting people to come out and we want invested high streets. And so all of our competitors will download the Deltic Knight Index. We can see who's done it, but we're really pleased with that. And, you know, we bump into each other at, you know, industry awards, dinners and, and the like. And, uh, and we always chat and catch up. And, uh, you know, they're really appreciative of it. And I know that the Deltic Knight Index uh, has helped people get money for their concepts or, or to refinance their business. Um, and that's really important to me because I honestly am a flag waver for the sector and not just my company. Of course, like 95% of my time is for my company. But it's no good me, and I see no benefit whatsoever trying to dismiss all my competitors as rubbish and, you know, look at me and aren't we great. We need our sector to be investable as a whole. And saying anything that helps uh, maybe a startup or maybe a group of 20 clubs that's been held by private equity refinance to the next private equity owner, that's a good thing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and if, if you're not from this industry, like for me, I may be unique, but certainly a lot of what you spoke about is really interesting for anyone that's in kind of any type of leisure mm. in, in city centres. Is this something that if, if you're in a fitness club, you can go and download or do you have to be in the fitness world or, or sorry, in the, in the nightclub business? Well, I think, <laughs> well, first of all, I think, you know, we all need, uh, if we're talking about gyms, for example, you need a load of gyms out there, but you don't need too many. And you certainly want the space to be investable because there aren't many people who've got the money to go out and just open gyms personally themselves and then grow a big business. They're going to borrow some money from somewhere, whether it's, you know, private equity, a fund manager on a market or, or indeed a, a, a bank. And so you need people to be positive about it. I guess the lessons as much as anything is that I know that gyms also go through this oversupply and a few shut and then they can often cut costs if they're buying the assets out of businesses that are closed. But it's important for me that you stick to your brand values, whatever they are, that you stick to knowing your consumer, what they're prepared to pay and what they expect for it. You make sure that you don't take on too much debt. You make sure your marketing's relevant. Uh, and you make sure that whilst it's, and I keep referring to the boring stuff, but the model works and you've got the balance sheet to do it. Yeah. Uh, and, um, you know, it, it's not difficult. And there are, you know, the, the DNA between the leisure businesses, is, you know, is 90, 95% the same. Uh, and you, you know, you need the right people. You need them trained properly. They need to walk the floor and be great with people because this is hospitable. You know, people, you can do more than any computer program can ever do if you can say hello and goodbye. <laughs> no computer program can catch up on that. And, and if you get all these fantastic ways of drawing people in, but they don't have a great experience when they come, they're not coming back. And I think there's, you know, that too much focus on, on that sort of side of things is no good because if you're spending a lot of money on marketing with social media or on entertainment or on gym equipment, you've got to get the money back somewhere and you can overinvest and over egg in those areas. Yeah, yeah, very useful. So can anyone, where can people go if they want to take a look at this report, the Delta Index? Oh, right, okay. Uh, it sounds like I'm here to advertise the Delta Knight well, Index. Well, yeah, <laughs> please. <laughs> well, listen, it's a report available if you just look at deltagroup.co.uk, uh, Google that, you'll see some uh, uh, link in there that shows people the Deltic Knight Index is out every quarter. And hopefully you'll, you'll see some insights that will show you that going out is important, that in real life experience is important, that it's still uh, as future proof as ever because people haven't invented something that actually uh, is as good as me talking to you face to face. Yeah. And long may that 
continue. Yeah, absolutely. So final question then. Um, we ask this of all our guests. Escape Your Limits is about escaping what you believed is impossible and gone on to make it possible. What would be a memorable example of you escaping your own personal limits? Wow. Uh, <laughs> I should have primed you for that yeah, one. Yeah, I think you should have done. <laughs> well, I'm going to answer it. And if I haven't answered the question properly, then we can always stop we can, and yeah. uh, I'll we come up with it. Out, yeah, <laughs> but I tell you, I spent years trying to get a deal away, um, both as a management buyout candidate and a management buy-in candidate. And I must have looked at 15, 20 companies to buy, groups of pubs, bars, nightclubs. And every time I fell at the last hurdle. Uh, but I kept learning. I kept learning that I was over-analytical, uh, that if I was buying a business that actually had been going through some tough times, then if you're going to graph that, it's only going to be a graph going down. And that I probably didn't have um, the full team around me when I was out looking at businesses, uh, to the point where I, I kept breaking off and going and getting a job. Um, uh, luckily all senior jobs people still felt there was something with me but every time I was trying to uh, raise capital I just kept falling and failing it's hard work uh, you'll have a whole load of friends that are middlemen that will take you to a whole load of people who actually have the money but what you don't realize is that your chances are probably five percent and they don't tell you that and so what I did was I learned every time I went through a process and eventually I did three deals in six months because I stopped worrying about trying to guess what the cloakroom tape was going to be on a Tuesday in three years time in one of the businesses and just try to turn the stones over and look for the opportunities of what had gone wrong with the business and how I could fix it uh, and, and stick to the headlines because if you're burying yourself in the minutiae uh, then actually you'll probably never get your head out of the sand. And so for me, if I've got a lesson to anybody and you're trying to raise capital, it's remember those words, don't get bogged down in tiny bits and pieces, have the big picture right and go and sell it and, and sell it wide. Don't just go to one person. Fantastic. Well, Peter, you've got a fantastic business. So we, we could talk for hours. It's, a, it's an industry I'm fascinated by and I, I, I see a lot of similarities between, you know, as you say, a lot of businesses in that hospitality sector, and it, you know, it comes down to some real basics. You know, yeah. face to face, say hi, hi and buy, and shake, look them in the eye, and um, and uh, yeah, some things don't ever change, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> thank goodness. <laughs> Peter, thank you so much, Matthew. Good to see you. All right. Okay. Thanks. Thank Cheers.